Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Day Zero Podcast. I'm Spectre. With me is Z. In this episode, we have some work from Google pushing to secure open source, a MediaTek boot ROM exploit, hacking Nespresso smart cards for free coffee, details of an iOS kernel bug, and some other miscellaneous topics that are mixed in there. Um, before we get into those, though, I will quickly shout, I'll be doing a stream with TeamStar again this week, I believe. Uh, we haven't nailed down a date yet, but you can follow us on Twitter, or join our Discord. Um, that's where we post all of our, our updates. That'll um, be so... your PS4 stream again, yeah? Yeah. Oh, um, so how far along are you guys in that? What's the update? <laughs> uh, so we were working out an exploit strategy. We got some more details worked out on the last stream. Uh, with a team star managed to figure out a little bit how Slayer's Govi's POC worked. Um, we definitely ended off with some questions, though. Um, so I think hopefully by like the end of the next stream, we should have. Um, like a promising exploit strategy somewhat implemented. We probably won't have like a ROP chain done and everything, but uh, I, th I think we will hopefully get a an exploit strategy like fleshed out in the next, in this week's stream, so. Okay, yeah, I, if I recall correctly, you did have it crashing already, correct? Yeah, we had it crashing, uh, just not the crash we wanted. <laughs> <laughs> we were Fair getting enough. like a, an assertion panic or something like that. Um, but yeah, tune into our Discord and our Twitter. That's we'll post there closer to when it happens. Um, I'm thinking it'll probably happen Wednesday or Thursday, but we'll we'll let you know on, on those channels. Um, but yeah, uh, we'll also shout out that Z, you made a, a blog post last week. Uh, I shouted it out on the stream, but that it was like the day after the podcast. So um, I, I definitely think this this blog post will be interesting to people who listen to the podcast so i'll let you uh talk about it a little bit and, yeah, and quickly shout it out there is yeah there isn't a ton to say i mean the title says pretty much everything getting started with exploit development we've had that um uh exploit development or resource for exploit development while not dying from covid or whatever we called it we've had that for a while and kind of linked that out but I've kind of just felt like we needed something a little bit more structured, and especially after our discussion video about hacking the art of exploitation, where I've kind of started moving away from uh, uh, recommending those older books, basically. I, I wanted to put something together that had, you know, just a bunch of free online resources that I think kind of do the job better and just walk through uh, at least my thoughts on and then getting up to where I'd kind of consider intermediate exploit development. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's it's not uncommon to find like resource dumps with just like a bunch of links. But I think where you go through and explain like the purpose of including each link and where you go from there and like the overall flow. Um, I think that's like really valuable. And I haven't really seen many other resources that do that. So. Yeah, I mean that's that's honestly a pet peeve of mine is just having a um having a resource dump. Like here's a bunch of books. Nobody's going to read every book on the list. There's some people will, but they won't know what they're supposed to get out of it and they'll end up wasting a lot of time. So I do kind of pick and choose like several of these resources I do just say, you know, go right through, but um like I bring up Hone College just like particular modules in it and mention kind of what you're specifically trying to learn from each of these. Uh, which I think is at least more useful for somebody, especially if you already know a few things, you can figure out where you need it or where you can skip to. It's kind of another aspect of that. But yeah, I, I want to kind of get it out there. And I think we do plan to kind of follow this up with something about kind of making that jump between and doing CTF or toy binaries and moving to more real world uh, exploitation. But I figure we'd kind of start off with the basics. Yeah, bridging that gap is is challenging. So I think it's it'd definitely be worth doing another piece of content on that at some later point. Um, but yeah, so anybody out there who's been like looking to get into exploit development, wasn't really sure where to start it, or or just wanted more resources to look at, um, take a look at Z's blog post. Um, it'll be in the link uh, in the description of the video. Um, I'll also link it in, in chat for anybody listening uh, or anybody watching live on Twitch. But yeah, uh, definitely check it out. Uh, with that said, though, I think we can get into some news topics. So we can talk about uh, Google's uh, no prevent fix framework. So Google put out a post about this framework for um, 
trying to tackle vulnerabilities in open source, you know, aiming to build a consensus on the meta level when it comes to uh, fixing vulnerabilities and getting those vulnerability fixes shipped um, and increasing transparency and review for critical software. So the goal, the ultimate goal here is to try to increase security on the supply chain side of things. Um, as they point out, there's a lot of software that uses dependencies, which the people using those dependencies don't know the code base of, or sometimes don't even know the existence of, um, looking at you, Node. Uh, th there's there's people who install like Node packages that have dependencies on other Node packages, which have their own dependencies, and it's it's hell um, trying to figure out like what parts of your code are potentially vulnerable because of that. So that's where Google's kind of coming out here with their no prevent fix breakdown. Um, so that basically comes down to know about the vulnerabilities in your software, prevent addition of new vulnerabilities, and fix or remove vulnerabilities, which is a very high level overview, I will say. Um, it is high level. Um, it, it's basically just trying to break down the way of thinking about vulnerabilities for open source software. So it makes sense to be high level. They're not pulling into specific applications. Um, and they kind of just lay out, I I think what's more valuable of this post is more, they lay out some of the goals, which they kind of plan to reach through each of these points. Like, is a goal for knowing your vulns, uh, you know, having kind of precise vulnerability data available, a standard schema for describing those vulnerabilities, or like a vulnerability database. Oh, and they go on to the other ones. The critical software one is... I don't know how I want to say this. I was a little bit, um, little bit concerning, I guess. And that's just the wariness about Google and kind of their control over everything. I mean, I don't feel like Google should be dictating the terms for open source software and how it should be developed. And I was kind of thinking about that as I was reading through this document. It's like, oh, no, I don't know how much control I really want to see Google having to define all of these terms and define what happens. At the same time, they they make absolutely valid points. Like I, I don't think Google is really off base in any of the things they're talking about here and any of the issues that they're seeing. Like that all seems accurate. I just kind of you know look this. You know how much control are we going to or how much power are we going to give Google over this? So I think that's a fair concern. Um, I'll be honest. When I was reading through it, I, I didn't even really think about that. Um, I took it more as a suggestion type post of this is what we should look at doing where not so much um this is what we're going to make people do um that, that's kind of the tone i took away from it but i could absolutely like understand that concern especially where it's it's google you know no and um, it definitely is but google is obviously a thought leader you know what they push out people will start to follow um and i think you know this will be more formalized in the future i was starting to think you know is this maybe the time where we should be considering sort of more certifications for like the development process? And I don't know how much that would really help. I mean, certifications aren't necessarily all that meaningful, but at the same time, these are certain process level things that can actually be reasonably well audited. Like, you know, are the developers known people um, or is an honest developer? And being able to have some sort of certification that open source software can then say, yes, we kind of meet this thing meet this kind of quality standard in terms of having the code reviews and having all of that. Like, I, I think that can be somewhat fair. Um, I don't, I wouldn't want like any sort of paid certification where it's kind of a pay to play sort of situation. But I do feel like there's some room for actually having a proper specification brought out from this or developed out of this. Yeah, so we kind of talked before about a, a project that came out of Google, which was the criticality score. And they actually mentioned that in this blog post. The other thing which I don't think we covered was uh, their scorecard system. At least I don't think we covered it. I couldn't find any mention of it in my notes. Um, but basically, uh, their idea here is to like rate repositories, um, evaluate various factors of, of the repo and give it a rating. Um, and how that would tie into their framework would be like evaluating the score of each dependency. And then if it's below a certain, uh, a certain threshold, you would prompt for further inspection on that. Um, so there were a few other points I wanted to call out here too, which um, I had some thoughts on. 
Um, one of them was one of their goals for the no portion was to accurately track dependencies and reduce the size of dependency trees. Uh, <laughs> good luck with that. I, I feel like that's a very uh, idealistic world that that point lives in. I yeah, don't think that's, that's actually going to happen. That's going to be hard for, I think, a lot of companies because really doing that ends up meaning you build everything in house. That's where you get you get rid of all your dependencies by doing it all yourself. And that, you know, is kind of defeating the purpose of a lot of open source software being, you know, sharing that code. So everybody doesn't need to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, and that presents its own issues when it comes to vulnerabilities. Um, which which is another discussion, which I don't think we'll get into here. Um, but yeah, and, and another point they they make, uh, which I thought was actually a good one, I think, is um, the, the standard schema for vulnerability databases, you kind of talked about it earlier, which, so you might think like, hey, we already have CVEs for that. Um, when it comes to open source software, though, there's a lot of security issues that get fixed with no assignment of a CVE, or it's hard, to, like, it's hard to really work CVEs into open source. So I think a better, like, more structured system for that does make sense, uh, which is worth calling out. Um, more structured system does make sense, and... I guess that's actually going to be kind of our next topic is about their attempt or their starting attempt at solving that. But um, yeah. before we jump onto that, one of the other things, they, they call out specifically uh, kind of the trust in the build process and transparency for artifacts being generated. And I do think that is, in my opinion, one of the more important things. I mean, yeah, code review and all of that is absolutely important too. I mean, it, like I said before, they make a lot of really good points within this. Uh, I just want to specifically kind of call it the artifacts because I feel like that gets left behind in a lot of situations where people just aren't really thinking about uh, having those verifiable and repeatable builds. Uh, so, I don't know. I mean, it, it's something I think a lot of open source projects just need to consider is the fact that people need to be able to trust these build processes. They need to be able to basically take or they need to enable everybody else to be able to take their build or take their product sorry and rebuild it themselves and see that they're getting the same build as is being released uh, kind of having that repeatable process because that comes in that's one of the places where you can detect the supply chain back is if hey they built this and you know had it with this you know release hash and i'm getting something completely different something's different about our builds um, and I think that's stronger than just having, um, well, I guess ha having the hash, but you need to know how to build the product in order to get the exact same hash out of it. Uh, so like the hash is part of it, but it's not the whole story. Yeah. Um, so like there are definitely some good points in here, but I will be honest. I feel like there is a lot of cruft in here that talks about things that are like pretty obvious and things we've known about for a while. Like they have a paragraph that talks about um, how it would be great if we could just not introduce vulnerabilities and fix all vulnerabilities in a timely manner that are found. Like, I mean, obviously, yeah, that that's the ideal scenario. Um, and I, I know yeah, they just try don't to write break bugs. Exactly. Just write <laughs> yeah. it in Rust. Um, like, I know they try to break down those concepts into goals to attempt to make them more achievable. Uh, my issue is, though, some of those goals, they seem like things that are great when you write it down. But, like, how are you actually going to do that? When it comes to the implementation side, I think there's, like, some of these points are really lacking, um, such as that reducing the size of dependency trees, for example. Um, it just feels like kind of that PM type thinking, like, yeah, just do these things and we'll be in a better place without, like, much focus on how practical those goals actually are in fairness um, i mean it feels like some of them are like the pipe dreams they're what we want to work towards and as you said kind of an ideal world thing i think that's fair for them to do i just feel like there's a lot of it like there's there's some paragraphs that i think could like it it felt like it took me a while to get to the good stuff when i was reading it you know what i mean like the first like half of the page is mostly like filler, <laughs> like talking about wanting to know, prevent and fix vulnerabilities. I feel like a lot of people reading the post probably already know that you want to like take that process. Um, so yeah, I just, I just uh, wish I think were it's a still bit fair more to list it out though. Fair enough. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's totally possible too, that this is just an early stage post and they plan to flesh out more of those details later, which um, as you mentioned earlier, that we do have a follow up blog post, which uh, is, is pretty cool that we'll cover in a second here. 
Um, but yeah, when it comes to the ethical concerns that you kind of brought up, um, I, I, I think more of my, at least my initial concerns were more on the implementation side than the ethical side. So, so I guess we can talk about uh, OSV, which is coming out of these efforts. Uh, so that stands for Open Source Vulnerabilities. Uh, it's being launched by Google, mainly to address that no portion of the framework. Uh, the project's premise is, uh, uh, premise is to use automated analysis to determine where a bug was introduced uh, and where it was fixed in a dependency used by an open source project um, in an effort to identify vulnerable versions of that dependency um, so that people can just look up whatever dependencies they're using and see if they have any vulnerabilities in that version. Um, so it'll basically take a reproduction test case for a bug and a set of steps to build the application. Uh, then, it'll, then it'll automatically perform by section to try to find those uh, commits and identify the range of affected versions. Right now, it's only getting data fed in from OSS fuzz exclusively. They do try to uh, plan to add support for Golang, NPM, PyPy, and more uh, in the future. It also exposes an API uh, to let users query with their package version or commit hash header uh, to the API to get a response to the vulnerabilities that affect that package, which which I think is cool. I think this is a useful project and uh, definitely has some some real world value. It's a nice straightforward API. Um, as you mentioned, though, like they are limiting this pretty much. At, well, not limiting it. Right now, it is only OSS fuzz, which I think is a pretty big. Um, or that's quite lacking, I guess, is what I'd say. Um, OSS fuzz is going to have, like, obviously, it's finding plenty of bugs. If, I feel like, like, just for starting, they should have still at least included CVs. Like, I don't know. I mean, it feels like this is really designed around, you know, what's convenient to do with OSS fuzz rather than uh, raising the question of what's easiest for open source to kind of get involved with and start working with like i think if there's a way for open source to more easily get involved where it's not just they have to be part of oss fuzz um in order to get their vulnerabilities known there if there's some mechanism for them to report something like that um like i don't know what that would look like um or maybe they'll plan to do that in the future also but i don't know it just it feels like, this is just something that's specific to OSS fuzz. Yeah, I mean, I could see how you would, uh, like, interpret that. Um, but what I think is, I think they just started with OSS fuzz since that's kind of something they can control and integrate with easier. Oh, um, for sure. Yeah. I mean, clearly they're going to work with OSS fuzz because that is something they have. And thank you, Balika, for the five-month uh, tier one. Um. But yeah, OSS fuzz is definitely something that they're going to work with because that's convenient for them. It just seems like the whole thing is kind of designed around being have a convenient setup for what OSS fuzz is already doing rather than a more general purpose tool. And maybe that'll change in the future. Um, I, I like I wouldn't put it past them to to do that. But at the same time, I, I just I don't. I don't see the current path for it for open source projects to actually get involved with this without also needing to be part of OSS fuzz. So I think where this will really add value, um, if it continues to get developed and it does end up pushing towards those future goals, um, NPM especially, uh, NPM and Go is probably where this would be useful. Although I think NPM does shout out vulnerabilities in packages uh, when you install them, right? It's just that so much garbage gets printed to the screen that nobody looks at that. Yeah, NPM um, does. Um, so NPM it, does kind of already have something like that. Well, yeah, it tells you if like any of your dependencies do have a vulnerability or... Um, it's also kind of able... Well, it'll update dependencies, or it can update dependencies for you also. So kind of takes a step at resolving it. And I mean, GitHub does something similar too in terms of scanning your dependencies. Yeah. Yeah, they have their security actions report or whatever. I um, guess you kind of, or sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, go ahead. I didn't really have anything else um, to bring up there. I was going to say, you kind of tied in on, you know, the question of whether or not Google will keep supporting it and developing it. And at first, when I was reading this in the previous post, I kind of had that feeling of, okay, well, you know, Google definitely has this trend of 
uh, killing products. Starting things and killing them. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, you know, can you trust this? Like, can you you start developing off this API? Can you actually trust Google's going to keep this around for very long? And I know. So I was being a little bit cynical about that. And then kind of reminded, I guess, I got reminded that they did develop the um, Open Source Security Foundation, uh, which, you know, I mean, it hasn't been around that long, but it it's unlikely that they're really going in that. So it is kind of in line with some of the other things Google has done with a long term focus. So I, I'd be more likely to trust this to kind of stay around for a little while, more so than just the random Google product. Yeah, when it comes to security, Google's a, a lot better, I think, on that front. Um, but yeah, like mainly what they're trying to do here is just streamline that flow of finding bugs and getting those bugs, uh, getting people who use uh, products that have those bugs notified. Uh, that way they can update or, or whatever. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I think it's a promising system. Um, I just think it's it's it needs more work before it's interesting to more people, I think. Yeah, I'd agree with that as a summary. Um, I Like I said, I've been kind of cynical about both of these posts from Google at the same time. like I think that they're making steps. They're making the right steps. Um, as an industry, we need, a, need to start focusing more on the security and all that, and they're taking steps to tackle that. I, I don't fault them for that whatsoever. Uh, me being cynical is just, you know... I, being wary about Google, I guess, but at the same time, they make a lot of the right points. Like, I don't disagree with anything that's been done, and I do think the API at least is promising. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I like cynicism. I, I think it's uh, it's good for branding, so, you know, all good. Um, but yeah, even though this is in early stages, uh, if you're interested in checking it out, they do have a website at osv.dev, which has the API documentation that Z was talking about. And it also has a list of bugs that have already been aggregated from OSS fuzz. And they have like a nice in browser search feature for that. So um, you can kind of see what the intent behind it is and what the end result looks like. Uh, and hopefully what it'll look like when it comes to other uh, future applications other than just OSS fuzz. But yeah, I mean, looks cool. It'll be interesting to see where it goes uh, is, is how I'll, I'll end that one off. So BugCrowd uh, did a post on the top 10 most common bugs of 2021 so far. Uh, so obviously, uh, we're not very far into 2021 yet, uh, but there's still some insights that BugCrowd was able to offer from the stuff that's been seen in the last month or so. I, I don't know if we're going to go through everything on the list. Um, I'll probably I mean, just call out the ones yeah. I found interesting. Yeah, there um, isn't a ton that's really... Oh, that's surprising. A lot of it related with like something that's on OWASP top 10. There was only one that was actually interesting to me or kind of unexpected. And that was a subdomain takeovers being at number three on the list. Um, I, I felt like so we've covered a handful of subdomain takeovers in the last year. So, like, I can understand why we're seeing a few more. It's just surprising to see that so high because it's not one of those often talked about vulnerabilities. Like Spectre said, though, we are very early in 2021. I doubt that'll be the case that by the end of 2021, you know, subdomain takeovers are one of the most popular attacks. But I do think it's an attack that has been getting a little bit more practical in recent years and getting a little bit more... Uh, more people kind of looking at it and looking for it because it's one of those things that can be relatively easy to automate. Just, you know, find the subdomains a company actually has DNS records for um, and see if any of those match. Because a lot of the takeovers that we've covered have basically been a uh, CNAME record or something pointing off to a domain for like some cloud service. That's been the majority that we've covered. And I feel like that sort of attack, as the cloud has grown in popularity, so have or so has the potential for that sort of attack. Yeah, so I, I will probably I'll I'll shed out the bottom two and top three, I think, uh, of the top ten. Um so at the bottom two they had uh, RCE, uh, number nine they had open redirect, and then top three they had um uh, subdomain takeover, cross-site scripting, and sensitive data exposure at number one, commonly through like logs or repositories or whatever. Um, the one that 
there was one that surprised me other than the subdomain takeover one though and that was the auth bypass being so low they had auth bypass um at like number seven so what they talk about there is like complex auth systems that involve like single sign-on and saml and such um it surprised me that it was that low because i feel like we cover those types of issues a lot on the podcast and it could just be that small sample size problem of not being far enough into the year to to get a good conclusion on that but th- that was like the the biggest thing that stood out to me i think was off bypass being so low i mean i think it's fair to also point out like it's low in terms of the top 10 but it's still in the top 10 um so That's like, fair it's still present like it's it's still not um when i'm choosing the topics each week like if i see you know yet another access report that looks like every other access access report I'm not too interested in just covering it on the podcast, so that can also change why why you're maybe seeing something or expecting to see that a little bit higher. Um, mm, that's also a fair call out, yeah. Th- there, fair there are a couple explanations for that. They don't actually release what the numbers are for any of these, just that these are the top 10. Which kind of sucks. I think the numbers would have offered some insights, but... perhaps. Bug crowd is pretty opaque though. Like they have a activity page like uh, Hacker One does. Uh, last time I looked at it, which I haven't looked at it in a little while, but uh, the most recently disclosed report was like three months ago. Like they don't disclose reports very often, so uh, I just imagine a lot of their clients don't want that information getting out. Which is totally fair. Um, it just it would have been cool to see those numbers, but I, I can understand why they wouldn't want to include them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like like you said, when I was reading through this, I thought the exact same thing. A lot of these are totally expected. Um, like RCE being the the last one on the list. Like often, there's easier methods to to accomplish an attack than RCE. That's that's kind of a and and usually that's something you hit like against a client, uh, not against like a, a server or something like that. Which a lot of these other issues are those more like web type issues that are hitting the server directly. So it it totally like a lot of the things on this sense uh, on this list, um, it makes total sense where they are in the list. So, um, out of except chat, for the one I pointed out, oh, uh, we kind of have the question more RCE than denial of service. Um, and was denial of service specifically on this list? Doesn't look like it. No, um, they so didn't have denial of service would just be out. Um, and I think that has more to do with the fact that a lot of web apps, like you don't get a lot of denial of service things or a lot of the denial of services that you do get reported are very minimal in terms of their impact. Like, OK, you can't access this page if on the user that you perform the attack with sort of scenario, which. I, I don't know. I mean, it, denial of services definitely do get reported, actually. Um. No, I was going to say I thought Bug Crowd themselves actually did a post recently about denial of services in their bug bounties, uh, but I actually don't think it was. It was uh, one of their directors, uh, Coding Go, it's another channel. He did a post about, or did a blog about, I'm just seeing if I could pull it up quickly here. Uh, but yeah, no my worries. guess would just be that more RCE... Uh, simply because denial of services maybe don't tend to get reported as often would maybe just be a stab at the dark about that. Yeah, that that was kind of my thinking as well. Is often when you're talking about thoughts, if it if it's not like, if it's not something that could be turned into an RCE, it either doesn't get reported or the report gets ignored or closed or something like that because it's specific circumstances or it's just not interesting or it's obvious like. Hey, if you send a billion requests to this page, you can like, you know, stuff like that. So I I just don't think I think it's just specific to web where DOS isn't a a big. uh, Yeah, well, web and network security, Um, like if if this had if bug crowd had more of like the binary applications where, you know, every remote code execution can probably also cause a crash. um, I feel like it might be different because you'd get more reports of exploits that maybe haven't been fully weaponized that just go as far as well we got the crash that's good enough and thus getting more denial of service reports i did also just notice something on the page um in cross-site scripting it mentions there cross-site scripting is said to be discovered back in 2005 by amic klein 
somebody in chat tell me if I'm going crazy, but I definitely remember cross-site scripting at least in like 2001. Um, I don't know if it was quite called that yet, but I mean, they're not saying that he just coined the name. It's was discovered and i feel like there's no way that can be right because i remember being you know uh uh a kid doing some of that on one website that was definitely before 2005 it was definitely before i was in my teens yeah that's really weird i like i was really young in 2005 i did not have a computer when i was like six or whatever but um yeah i mean that seems really who knew basically um xss has been around forever so i would be surprised if it was yeah i mean i could imagine you know maybe maybe as the first person to do like a paper on it but 2005 just still seems so late yeah some something we can maybe check into but uh wikipedia has this microsoft security engineers introduced the term cross-site scripting in january 2000 that seems more accurate like, if yeah, I had to I'd guess, it would be around 2000, so... Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I could imagine it being earlier, but I couldn't... I, I, my memories of XSS do go back to about 2001. Um, so that's where I was kind of drawing from that. So yeah, I'm not sure if they're maybe referring to a particular like DOM-based XSS or something, maybe. Doesn't look like that, though. So yeah, that I just noticed that and definitely stands out and definitely seems definitely seems wrong unless my memory is just going crazy. You know, I'm getting old and having memory problems. Boomer Z. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, with that said, I think we can jump into some exploits. So uh, we have a headlining topic uh, right now, and that's uh, it's a fun, quick issue with Nespresso smart coffee machines which I believe they're basically like vending machines for coffee, right? Have you ever actually seen one of these machines, Z? Like in anywhere you've went? Like Yes, um, there's a company that I had an on-site project with. They had some of these machines. Oh, really? Okay. I don't think I've ever seen one of these machines. That's, that's what I was uh, asking there. But um, yeah, it seems like they're basically vending machines for coffee. Um, they use MyFair smart cards for storing your balance and whatnot to interact with the machine using NSC. Um, and, and those smart cards were probably broken by a group of uh, Radboud uh, University uh, researchers back in 2008 who re reversed it and were able to clone and manipulate the chip contents. And specifically, um, these are the MyFair Classic cards. The later ones are not vulnerable in the same way. Yeah. So the attack is pretty simple uh, that they pull off here. They basically use the uh, MFOC tool to... Um, break the few non-default keys that are present on the card uh, and they use that to decrypt the data blocks off of the card um, then they do that kind of classic thing you'll see in like game hacking for example where they record the value uh, of the money on the card with like one uh, 1.50 pounds uh, they buy some coffee to drop the card to 50 pence and then they compare the contents to see where that memory or that money counter is stored in memory um, and then they just smash that value to get infinite money, or rather 167,000 pounds. And then they rewrite that block back. So it's it's a fairly straightforward attack. Um, this is definitely nothing new. If, like I said, you've seen like game hacking and stuff, this, this is common there. Maybe not the crypto part, but um, that method of dumping to find the value and rewriting it. Um, because this is a hardware problem with the cards themselves, they can't be hotfixed though they can be worked around by updating the machines to store the money values on the server side and then just use the cards as a piece of ID, which is probably how it should have been done in the first place anyway. I don't know yeah, why they would um, store the money on the card. but I mean, there are cases where you just can't network it. You can't give it that connection. Of I don't think that's going to be the case for the majority of companies and stuff, but it does become an, yet another device on the network also then. So I, I can see the arguments, but I do agree with you. I think the default should be um, just using an ID and doing the lookup, not trying to store it locally, because you basically eliminate the entire class of local modifications or the entire class of attacks involving those local modifications if you simply use an ID and look it up. Although then you also run to the problem for local modification, changing the ID to look up another user. 
and, yeah. you know, stealing. So, like, th there are some potential issues there, too. Um, but yeah, for, for this attack, uh, the initial report of the issues were disclosed September 24th. Uh, full disclosure happened October 9th. And to Nespresso's credit, they agreed to the publishing of the write-up this month. And the reason I'm kind of calling that out is because that original attack from 2008 uh, with the university researchers, um, I think there was actually like a court case around that. Uh, I think the article mentions that, although I'm trying to find exactly where because I can't remember where they pointed that out. But there was some drama around that back in 2008. So it seems they've yeah, maybe so in you know, become lighter on that. Well, in 2008, the problem was that the researchers who first got attacked these MyFair cards, they were attacking it for, it was, I believe, a German public transit system. Uh, so it had a very oh, okay. significant impact, and they were the ones that kind of tried to stop the publication of it, I believe, and not, um, not necessarily the, comp or not, um, not MyFair. I believe was the case. I believe they mentioned that towards the start, start of the article somewhere. Yeah, I I know for a fact that I read it in there. I just can't find where now. I feel like I'm yeah, going it's, crazy. It's here at the start. NXP tried to stop the publication of the research by requesting a preliminary injunction. However, the injunction was denied. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. So yeah, that's that's a good point to bring up. Thank you. Um. But yeah, I mean, this doesn't really seem like it's a new attack. It seems like it's rather the revival of an older attack to be fitted to newer versions. Well, um, it's just, it's even just the reuse of it. It's just, it's fun to kind of talk about those NFC and like the card attacks. I mean, they've reused the same tooling from before. I mean, it's not a new attack by any means. Yeah. Um, it is worth noting these MyFair Classic machines have been superseded. Uh, by MyFair Plus, which uses AES-128 and is fully backwards compatible. Um, because the, the main issue here is just that the keys they're using aren't, aren't secure. They can be broken by this public tool in a matter of minutes. So um, there is MyFair Plus, which is more secure, and, and they recommend clients who need that extra security to, to upgrade to that. Um, I, I wanted to take something out of chat, though, that I noticed, which was uh, I've seen these, but they didn't need a card. You just pick the coffee you want for free um, at every place I've been to. I mean, it does seem really strange that you're going to have a coffee machine at your workplace and you're going to make it so people have to pay like 50 cents or whatever for one. Um, I mean, at places that I've worked, the coffee machine and the coffee is just there and you can do it for free. It seems like uh, mega penny pinching to make people pay for coffee at your workplace. Yeah, so. I don't know. Um, I, I've seen both. I Well, with these machines in particular, I've actually only seen them at I think I've only seen them at the one company that did uh, have, I think it was like 25 cents uh, that they were yeah. charging. It, it wasn't a crazy price. I don't drink coffee, so I maybe they've had it at other places and I just didn't notice. I wouldn't be going out for it or going to grab any anyhow. Um, I've seen both. It makes sense for the company trying to make some money, but like I said, it does feel like penny pinching. Even when they keep the costs really low, it's still like uh, yeah, uh, penny pinching, but I have seen it. There are some companies that go that route, I guess is what I'll say. I don't want to start mentioning any names. So, Yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously their prerogative. It just seems uh, silly to me or something like that. But hey, I mean, if your company has uh, one of these machines and you have to pay for coffee, and it, it could be a fun exercise, especially if it's a security company that you work at. Let's not uh, encourage them to steal. <laughs> well... Okay, maybe bring it up with the company, not not use it to steal coffee. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll move on to uh, spoofing and attacking Skype. So in this article, we have various spoof attacks as well as spear phishing and a DOS on Skype uh, from Mr. Docs. Uh, they have a table of contents for a pick your attack, basically, because uh, they, they, they detail, like I think, seven different attacks. Uh, mo most of them are spoof-related. Yeah, they detail several of them at the same time. Almost all of these are effectively the same attack. Um, like I'll scroll down here. Spoofing links, you, all you're doing is um a lot of the Skype messages just have content as one of the options in like the message body, I guess. So spoofing a link. Oh, you change the uh, URL that the href goes through in the A tag. 
Um, you move on. What's the next one there? Spoofing file names? Yeah. Oh, what do you do? Oh, you're changing the content again. <laughs> just to use a different thing there. Like, they're all kind of the same thing. You've got the message and they just don't do... They basically generate these messages from the client side or from the sender side rather than the receiver side. Uh, which is basically where the vulnerability comes in. You can modify it to show, you know, a random file size, random file names. Um, they do kind of mess mention using Skype's domain. So when you upload a file, it goes onto Skype's well, domain there. So you could use that for kind of like a spear phishing. Um, they mentioned that, which I did think was kind of interesting to have that Skype URL for sending files over to people. Obviously, it's going to take a very targeted sort of attack to like for the fact that it's Skype.com to actually make a difference. But I did think it was kind of interesting nonetheless he'd be able to do that. And um, I'm not sure what their expiration process is, but it sounds like they don't really expire anything. And even if you delete the file or delete the message, it still is retained. So, you know, maybe build a Dropbox on that. That could be fun. Um, but yeah, I think the most impactful attacks in, in terms of how dangerous they could be are probably the spoof attacks when it comes to the links and file names. Because people will use that. They'll look at the link and think, oh, that looks safe. Uh, that's a site I trust. Or the file name is safe because it doesn't have uh, an extension that looks malicious. But the fact that all of that is entirely you know, controlled by the attacker because the message HTML is crafted client side, that does make that breaks those assumptions that people commonly make. So I think for me, those attacks were, even though they were all related to the spoofing, which is a pretty simple attack, I think they're still probably the more impactful ones um, that I could see. Because um, the, the crash was like kind of interesting. Uh, the, the crash was based on the fact that you could add too many tags into the content section of the message body. Um, and you can basically turn that chat into a DOS primitive. Anytime somebody opens that chat, it crashes the client, um, but not on mobile. But that's just kind of like a, I don't really see many practical implications of that, whereas the, spoof, the spoofing and the spear phishing obviously do have more of those practical aspects to them. So, yeah, I mean, this this was a cool write-up. Um, I am surprised I hadn't heard about these issues before, though. Like. Skype has been around for like a super long time. I haven't used it in years. I used to use it back in like 2014 or 2015 or something. I mean, I uh, do remember us reporting on very similar issues in, I believe it was Slack, having a very similar kind of problem. Yeah. Yeah, but it's just, yeah, that, that was one thing I was thinking about this was like, why has nobody like seen this or reported this before? And maybe they did and I just didn't see them. That's that's probably likely. Um but yeah, like like Maliko said in chat, this is like this is a pretty dumb issue. Uh, it should never be crafting the exact thing that the other user sees on the on the attacker's side. Should be doing that on the server. I don't know why they did it this way. Probably just laziness. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, at this point, I don't think there's anybody that should be using Skype. Uh, Skype has is completely ruined for me as a platform. Even like with these security issues aside, the botting issues on Skype have been real bad. Um, it also it had some lazy design and other aspects too. I remember people used to be able to grab your IP um, if they had your like Skype name because they had like no protection on their API. It was just like there was a lot of things with Skype where I was like, yeah, screw this, I'm not using this anymore. Uh, especially now with Discord being out there, it does everything that Skype does and more better so there's really no reason to use skype so it doesn't make phone calls or like you receive phone calls that's a discord doesn't uh, i can't give my there skype number to because i do i have a skype number that i've used for years so that's my permanent phone number yeah that is that that's a fair call out but yeah i mean i feel like this is kind of like the final nail in the coffin for skype for me is like if you use skype read this blog post um, and then look at all the other stuff, and then stop using Skype. And I guess in so. fairness, I guess we should point out that it doesn't seem like this is like a bug bounty report. It seems like they're just laying out here are the attacks. So it's not necessary that these are new attacks, like nobody knew about this before. It's just that they're laying them out. Yeah, it's more of like uh, a, a researchy type post. They, they definitely don't mention anything about actually reporting these. 
um, which yeah. makes it seem like it's probably already no one to me. Yeah. Up next, we have an article on uh, both a local privilege escalation as well as an info dump on WebOS. Um, this is from uh, Andreas's uh, research into WebOS, which is used for LG smart TVs and fridges because we all need smart fridges and uh, smart watches as well as some HP phones and tablets, which kind of caught me off guard when I was doing some research into what used WebOS. I saw HP phones and tablets and I was like, wait, what? HP makes phones and tablets? But I think they're older. I think they were from like 2010 or something like that. Um, but yeah, basically WebOS is a Linux-based system. It it runs web apps, which are executed in the secure headless browser. Um, but those web apps can basically spawn their own services, which run as uh, Node.js applications. Um, and it also implements an API server for interacting with system services, one of them being the download manager, which runs as root. So that automatically makes uh, it an interesting target for exploitation for obvious reasons. Um, one of the methods that the download manager exposes is the ability to download files, as you would expect, um, which allows you to download files over the network to a restricted directory if the caller doesn't have privileges. Basically, how they check if you have privileges is they check the calling service name, uh, and they check it against a whitelist of prefixes, including com.webos. Um, and the, the, that download manager has that service name, so they have privileges technically. Um, so if you have those privileges, you can download anywhere as root. <clears throat> uh, sorry, the, the tool that ended up having the uh, the service name that uh, granted you privileges was the Luna Send Pub server. I got that kind of jumbled uh, in my mind there. But yeah, they ended up discovering that a, a tool to, uh, to interact with the API locally, which was that Luna Pub uh, Send Pub tool. Um, because it had that prefix, you could download an arbitrary file as root. Yeah, now, I, that, that I thought that wasn't was kind an immediate of a, pwn. I thought that was kind of a fun issue there, just because of the fact that the Luna, uh, what was that? Uh, whatever it was called, I forget Luna the name. Luna Send Pub. Send Pub, yeah. Um, it's a bit of a weird name. That's why. It threw well, me off there's Luna it. Send and then Luna Send Pub. Pub being the one that's accessible as like by any application to download and or by any application they can hit the pub one and then the other one is restricted to only things running as root um so the name kind of makes sense it's luna send it's meant to be used as like a command line tool so somebody's actually on the command line uh making some of these requests rather than it being a or actually, I don't know how the intent is so I shouldn't make claims about that but it seems like it's meant to be a tool for an actual developer on the command line to send something. Uh, but because of the fact that it just happens to be told they're providing you, it also has the name. As Spectre said, the way it checks their privileges is, is this coming from a com.webos or com.palm service? And in this case, yeah, by proxying through it, it absolutely is. Yeah, so, I mean, it's not an immediate pwn because while you have an arbitrary root file, right, it writes it as the root user. Um, so you can't just like hit a set you would binary because I, I kind of forgot this since he had to remind me, but when you overwrite a set you would binary, that set you would bit gets cleared upon write. So if you do that, the binary will no longer, uh, you, you won't be able to execute it as root. Um, the obvious next thing to try after that is to try smashing some configuration file that'll lead to Provesk down the line. Uh, so that's what they did. Uh, they found a configuration file for the Luna Service 2 hub daemon for internal communications, and that would execute a bash script as root on startup. So if you can smash that file uh, to make it execute an attacker controlled bash script, you can get command execution as root. Um, so that's the route they went. They used the arbitrary download to corrupt the configuration file, which would run the attacker controlled bash script, which ran a reverse shell through Python. So it's, it's a cool attack. Um, I'm not sure if it's fixed. Uh, they reported the issue on October 5th, and LG reached out on January 26th, over two months later, to say the issue would be fixed within the week. But there's no indication that they actually did fix it. Uh, but given the fact that they they given LG like three months at this point, and it's not a remotely exploitable issue since you need command line access, they decided to publish it anyway, which I think is totally fair. Um, from what I could find, the latest release for WebOS is 6.0, which was released on like January 15th, I think. So I doubt it is fixed. 
since they said it would be fixed within the week at the end of January. Though it's possible a fix did ship earlier on and the person who contacted the researcher wasn't made aware of that or something. That That's pure speculation on my part, but um, there is yeah, a bit of weirdness it, when it comes to knowing if this is a no day or if it's not. It is also kind of worth noticing that or noting that the researcher here who found this mentioned that it w didn't actually impact the latest LG TVs because they all make some modifications to WebOS. So it's the core WebOS like that they maintain and have as open source that's vulnerable to this, but that's not the WebOS that's actually running on LG TVs, which is probably the most popular user of WebOS. Yeah, it was it was strange trying to find devices that use it because I did a little bit of research to try to see how popular is WebOS and uh, like outside of the smart TVs, and smart fridges, uh, it, it didn't seem like it was used too much. So it, it's probably not like a, a majorly impactful issue or anything. And you do need like that to access that command line utility. As far as I know, uh, the only way you're accessing that Luna Send pub tool is through the command line. So I you I don't think you'd be able to hit it remotely or anything. So. Um, yeah, it's, overall, I think it's totally fair that they published this right up. But um, yeah, if, the, if you have a device running WebOS, it might be hittable. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, that, that's all the, the details we have there. So next we have a blog post uh, from Space Raccoon, who wrote up two issues he found in Facebook's Game Room when they were invited to Facebook's Bounty Con. So Game Room is not going to be a thing for much longer. It launched in uh, November of 2016, but it's going to get canned in June of this year. Um, but obviously, while the Bounty Con was running, uh, it was still fair game. Uh, so when he looked at the application, he noticed a few notable things. Uh, for one, it stored session data in an SQLite cookie database, which is uh, of interest. Um, just when you're looking at cookie like session data and being stored locally as cookies, Session hijacking is uh, a potential attack that can happen there. Um, it also included the Ceph Sharp library, which is basically an embedded Chromium browser for so C Sharp. I, I'm sorry, I want to stop you there. Session hijacking. What's what's your attack thought on that? Um, because like with session hijacking, you need some way to leak that session, and odds are like people aren't browsing the random web with this. So like often, like you'd have some way of clicking. Uh, get getting somebody to navigate to an attack page, which can then you know get them onto. Sorry, I'm I'm just saying it out there since you mentioned the session hijacking specifically. Do they mention session hijacking as one of the concerns? Like they mentioned the local SQLite file, but I was thinking more like permissions. Um, just because this is a kind of standalone browser. Okay, um, so I, I was. They didn't call out session hijacking specifically. That was something that I was thinking of when I read it. Um, so maybe maybe that's uh, not the, the best line of thinking. You were thinking something with permissions, sorry? Well, I was saying just since it's a file there, um, there's a chance that could be leaked with bad permissions, perhaps. I just saw that more as a oh, throwaway I comment. I didn't really think too much about it. It's just when you mentioned ses uh, session hijacking, I, I think. But then I guess if you had... Uh, so we're going to kind of get into the attack later where uh, they do kind of have a URL schema that they register to handle. So I guess in theory, maybe if access through that, he'd be able to steal the session, but then how are you going to... I, yeah, I guess it is hitting Facebook, so you could reuse the session. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking there. I, I'm thinking out loud here about that. Um, again, to kind of move on, I guess. Yeah, no worries. It's all good. Um... But yeah, so there was the uh, the session uh, or the cookies database that they noted. And the other thing was um, it being bundled on its own with 7-zip, uh, although that didn't end up being relevant. Um, so the, the first issue they found was a deserialization issue due to the use of binary formatter, uh, which is known for being insecure. Facebook used it for getting settings information as a serialized blob from the application settings database, which is something you're probably familiar with if you've written C-sharp a lot. Um, so using Wiseau Serial, he did manage to take advantage of the deserialization attack to pop calc, which is kind of cool, but there's no privilege escalation there. You're still running with user privileges. Um, so it's not all that interesting, right? You could just modify the like binary directly or inject a DLL or whatever and do the same thing, essentially. Um, 
Now, the second issue was abusing the custom URI scheme set up by Facebook that Z mentioned earlier. And, which, uh, with the last one, I will also mention Facebook rejected paying out a bounty on the deserialization for the reasons Spectre just mentioned. Yeah. And on the um, session token, I was just thinking again on that. Um, I guess if this session gets you into the Facebook account, then I guess it would be more useful than if it were just something local. Um, I wasn't thinking about that. I was kind of thinking this is standalone, but a Facebook session could be quite useful to be able to extract somehow. Yeah, which to be fair, I, I don't know if they're like uh, yeah, tied I don't together know either, per se. But so I, I that, that is speculation it. too, but. Yeah, that, that's kind of where uh, where my thought lines were going. Um, but yeah, so that second issue was abusing that custom URI scheme, which if you've watched the podcast before, this is an attack we've covered uh, a fair bit, especially recently. Um, so they have this custom FB games URI, which uh, would parse the host and take different parsing paths depending on what the host was. Um, they initially tried exploiting the launch local host, which seemed promising because it would basically take a path and launch that application. So it could have been useful for RCE, but it, it gets blocked by a confirmation dialog, so they, they didn't end up going further down, down that route. Um, the other attack path that they ultimately went with was the game ID host path, um, because the way the launch path worked was it would launch the bundled Ceph Sharp uh, Chromium-based browser, and it would send it to a Facebook URL with the ID you appended at the end of the sh uh, as the slug. Now, normally this would require another issue to take advantage of because you're still on the Facebook host. So you'd, you'd need like an XSS or an open redirect type scenario to be able to get the user directed to attacker controlled JavaScript. Um, but because the bundled version of Chromium was so old, I think they said it was like 63, um, it ended up using the old Facebook pages version, not the new one because the new one isn't supported on that browser. So the old Facebook pages accepted a parameter, this SK parameter, uh, which could be used to open an application ID in a new tab. Um, now, this this shouldn't have been viable because the URI scheme parser should have been throwing out anything after the game ID slug, so you shouldn't have been able to pass that SK parameter. Um, but their, their scheme parser actually supported passing Canvas parameters as a feature. Um, so you could set that parameter in a JSON payload and get it, rela like, get it relayed to that launch page. Um, so once you have that attack worked out and you have custom JavaScript running, mm -hmm. Um, there's multiple paths you can go to abuse it. Um, you could run custom JavaScript to potentially seal, steal session information, uh, whether or not that's useful. Um, that That's kind of what Z and I were trying to work through. Um, we're not totally sure, but that is a potential avenue you could go. Uh, you could you could use it to launch phishing dialogues. Um, the most interesting of all, in my opinion, is because it's an old browser, you can end day Chrome to get code execution too, if you wanted. Um, although I, I guess you... you you would still be in that same scenario as the first attack where you're not really getting a, a privilege escalation. So, uh, well, well, no, well no, actually, in this no, case you, you would are. use it for RCE. Yeah. So, yeah, it would still be interesting. Sorry, I, I kind of... Yeah, uh, there's there's plenty there. of exploits to choose from, too, since uh, Chromium 63 came out back in October of 2017. So, quite out of date. Yeah, back then, JavaScript uh, bugs were coming out at, in, in droves, so... Yeah, I mean, that that's probably the most interesting attack, in my opinion. Um, at, at the end of all this, he got the issue rewarded as high and got it into the top 10 leaderboard for BountyCon. This attack was a bit of a complex attack in the in the way that it involved nuances of multiple subsystems and critical factors, uh, mainly being like the outdated Chrome and outdated Facebook pages aspect. Um, but I love how many different attack paths there were because of those factors as well. Um, I think that was what made it the most cool to me was it, it was a cool it was a neat attack because it relied on so many little details and you could you could go multiple directions once you had it because of that fact of it being an outdated browser so it's i really fast, like this right it's also just the high level thing i mean you you get so many little details that matter when we're talking about like an ios kernel exploit um less so a lot of the times when we're talking about web things so it is it does kind of make it a little bit interesting it's nice to see yeah so six different major bugs were discovered in the realtek rtl 8195a wi-fi module uh these were found on a supply chain security assessment conducted by 
I, th- I think it's Vidu. I think we've covered like articles from this uh, this site before, and we we can never like be consistent on how I pronounce it. I'm just going to say Vidu because it sounds fun. Um, but yeah, these bugs can be leveraged for remote code execution as root on the Wi-Fi module, uh, which can be used to hop to the application process via the networking stack. Uh, this is notable because, as they point out, these chips are used a lot. Um, they're used in IoT, automotive, industrial systems, pretty much anywhere that there's a low power necessity and you're going to be using ARM chips, you're probably going to be using your Realtek Wi-Fi chip too. Um, so they found six issues in the WPA2 handshake mechanism alone, uh, the most severe one being hittable without knowing the Wi-Fi pre-shared key, Uh regardless of if the module was, was running as a client or access point, two of them could be exploited without knowing the uh, that key against clients, and the other three could hit clients but needed the network's uh, pre-shared key. Uh, further, what I'll mention before we get into the issues themselves, most of these issues are are stack overflows, and they're they're like very straightforward. There's like zero mitigations in place for stack overflows. There's no stack cookies. There's no ASLR, um, no non-executable stack. Which, I mean, this is IoT, so I guess that's kind of expected. But this is basically like 1990s exploitation. <laughs> so Yeah, straightforward. Um, and a lot of the issues all have kind of the same root problem, being that they trust the size um, or read a dynamic size into a fixed size buffer. Uh, like, I think... I want to say all five of the stack overflows are just attacker controls the size of something that it reads out and it reads into a fixed size buffer i think four of them are because one of them is a uh oh, a one is that iteration issue. yeah yeah so yeah four of them are just straight up like z said um just passing in an unchecked size um so I don't think I'll cover all of them in, in detail because, like you were saying, they're all basically the same. But um, the most severe one occurs in the key exchange and the uh, EA EA poll uh, frame parsing for checking the message integrity code. Um, they they parse an attacker controlled length and pass it to mem copy with no bounds checking. Um, it's a stack buffer of five twelve bytes in size. So you just send a large packet and you can corrupt the stack. And once again, that can hit client or access points, and it's before the the, the key is evaluated. Um, but yeah, like the other issues uh, using memcopy are basically the exact same thing, just in different areas. Um, I think yeah, it's I, like I one of them is find... like controlling the you send it in the size of the hash at one point um, of either MD5 or SHA1 hash, but it doesn't actually check the size matches either of those. It's just a 16 bit number. So you can go beyond the, or you can have a reading beyond. So that's the out of bounds read. The only one that isn't a stack overflow. Um, yeah. For all the stack overflows, it's like the size of the key that it, the access point is sending is read into a fixed size, 257 byte buffer. So you send it a larger key or at least larger length, and it's going to copy out. Um, I don't think a lot of these are too interesting, besides the fact they're there. I did think it was kind of interesting, you know, the effect, the fact that you can kind of attack the clients uh, with some of these, being that you would basically deauth them, spoof a malicious AP, have them connect to you, and then attack them. Um, other than that, like. I didn't find a lot of these too interesting, so I don't know how much we really need to dig into them. Yeah, I won't dig into them too much. Uh, the one thing I will say is, due to extremely like lucky circumstances, like I obviously Realtek didn't intend to make this like a CTF where the bugs were there, but they wanted to see if you could exploit them. Um, two of these issues can only lead to DOS and not code execution, um, and that's because basically the data can't be controlled. Um, it like one of them I think is HMAC hash data, which in theory maybe you could get somewhat controlled because SHA one and NB five are particularly a strong. Challenge. But yeah, practically speaking, I don't see you pulling that off. Um, and then uh, and another one just used data that uh, I I think it was another like uh, encrypted data, so you didn't really have control of the data. But it would have been exploitable if not for those circumstances. But I just wanted to point that out. Um, but yeah, like 
in all these issues and trust untrusted data goes completely unvalidated it's it seems like they didn't even try uh, i wish i could say i was surprised for something like a wi-fi module but i i can't really um this is one of those reasons why iot and ics are, are kind of a joke when it comes to like exploitation and, and and security is these types of issues um and it's really annoying because like i said earlier these media tech chips are not uncommon uh they're going to be used in like they're used in so many systems is the problem and you can tell like fragrantly they don't care about securing the chips because these are like if you had any security assessment on uh on this code i mean there there would have been like a a glowing map of issues but so that indicates to me that there wasn't even like there was no code review done here i don't think yeah, i can't um, imagine it um i will jump in and say thank you angry chair for the raid oh yeah awesome thanks dude um but yeah like the, these issues are just there's they're such memes uh and yeah that's why they're, they're so foundational i mean we were talking kind of the other stream either last one one before that about the windows exploitation course from offensive security uh kind of hating on it for some of the older aspects of the course and <laughs> you know might have been i mean this isn't windows but you know like that code is still out there the old style exploitation it's still there especially in these iot and these basically soft targets yeah, yeah these it, issues yeah it, there's you can't even really defend a lot of them yeah if you want exploitation on easy mode go to iot up next we have a really interesting topic that somehow barely got any coverage it seems across media um i didn't see it anywhere except for our like planner basically <laughs> um so we have a, a boot ROM vulnerability in MediaTek chips, which is another one of those chips which is used in a lot of devices, including phones. Um, this was published in the form of an MTK bypass for various phones, uh, which is used to allow bypassing the Google account login requirement when wiping and reinitializing a phone, I believe. Um, but this exploit will work on any platform that uses a MediaTek-based boot ROM, and it can't be patched because the, the boot ROM is read-only memory. It, it's kind of in the name, and it has no patch mechanism. It doesn't have patch fuses or anything of that nature. So, I mean, MediaTek can replace it in their manufacturing pipeline uh, or fix it in their manufacturing pipeline, but that would take a lot of money and a lot of time to fix. Uh, you would, you'd, you'd have to overhaul the production pipeline, basically, uh, for something like that. So... Yeah, th this this issue is going to affect a lot of devices. Um, now, the page we have up on screen doesn't have any technical information. Um, we do have some information we can share from a private source, though. Uh, th but they they want to remain anonymous, so uh, we're going to respect that. But we we will still cover some of the technical details. Um, so getting into the bug, basically, when sending control requests, uh, you can specify the index of what interface to send the request to. Uh, but, but there's no checking on that index. Uh, the boot ROM only has three interfaces, but you can specify any index. So if you just specify an index beyond three, it'll follow that and dereference a function pointer there and just jump to it. So you you basically gain code execution out of the box by uh, by way of Quite literally balance out of the box. Yeah, <laughs> very early on, very simple. There's no no uh, def in place. So I I. Don't know if there's ASLR in place or if that's going to be device specific, but no depth. So you get a very early jump. Just inject your shell code as long as you know where to jump to. Um, I feel like in this scenario, you're probably not going to have ASLR. I was that, just this early. Say, I doubt it. Yeah, boot ROM. I doubt it. I doubt there's ASLR. So. Yeah, I, I was actually just trying to think if I could think of any boot ROMs that would have ASLR at that point, and I can't really think of anything. Um, yeah, I can't either. Yeah, it does seem like like this impacts pretty much like everything media tech. It seems like, oh uh, yeah, going well. I don't know about like anything from this year, but at least into twenty twenty, uh, like chips coming out there, and it sounds like they don't have a good way of updating any of these to prevent it. Um, like they don't have, apart from just stripping the ROM and putting a new ROM in, which is kind of pricey. Like, they don't have a way to update the ROM. Uh, so any chip that's already been made with this, 
and they're probably not going to want to just toss all of them, is going to continue to be vulnerable until they get new ones out. Yeah, I mean, so it's interesting this got no coverage, uh, like we said earlier. I'm I'm guessing it has something to do with the means of which it was released. Um, people probably saw this, like, MTK bypasses, like a self pwn um, like something you'd use to mess with like the bootloader of your own device or something, but it has a lot more implications than that because like, like we said, it affects any device that uses the media tech chip that includes modems, uh, global navigation, satellite systems, and, and any other system that uses media tech SOCs. Um, now you, you do need physical access to exploit it, but that doesn't mean it's, it's not impactful. There's many potential cases where, uh, that are within a reasonable threat model. I mean, even if you just stick to phones, um, there's the theft of, theft of devices, right? The entire point of having the Google login when you try to reinitialize a device is trying to prevent theft, right? I, I, I'm pretty sure that's the main mechanism behind it. So th there is like a, a classification of where this has impact. So it's weird. It's a really high impact issue that affects potentially like a lot of devices. And uh, it's like nobody cares. <laughs> I don't know. It's weird. Um, I guess it just kind of highlights how much of an impact the medium can have in which an exploit is published in terms of how far it reaches out with coverage. Yeah, that's I mean, the only thing I'm I not sure if it's that or if there was any attempt to actually kind of keep it a bit more quiet, too same time like we don't have a lot of information about it it's just here's mtk bypass and that's that uh so i do kind of feel like you know the the medium probably does have an impact because it is somewhat opaque unless you kind of know what you're looking for like it's not in a medium that's going to be readily understood just by your average person reading it do you kind of recognize the impact of that so like it can be it can also be like a actual attempt at like, you know, just don't report like uh, telling journalists not to report on something because they can't fix it. Or can't readily fix it, I guess. I can yeah. see it going either way. I don't have any evidence on that other side. So I mean, going from what we see, I would probably put most of the blame just on how it was released. But that is kind of just speculative. Yeah, I mean, I, I will call it quickly. We we like to like try to speculate and get in the heads of like people and corporations on this podcast. So there are some things we'll say where it's like we're we're purely speculating. We don't have evidence for those facts. So you know, don't take them and run. Basically, um, it's just something fun that we like to try to do to, uh, you know, get in those heads. It's a fun exercise. But... Have some discussion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I did want to take something out of chat. Uh, Beliga says that apparently Apple has ASLR in their boot ROM, which is what I was kind of thinking earlier. Uh, I wasn't sure, so I didn't say it, but I, I feel like if there was one boot ROM that did, it would be Apple because they're kind of, they're ahead of the curve when it comes to mitigations and, and whatnot. So they have depth uh, stack cookies and ASLR apparently in their boot ROMs um, because Checkmate uses ROP to get around that uh, in their, in their chain. So, yeah, I, I kind of figured that Apple would, but most chip most chips don't. I mean, when you're getting into those levels, ASLR is usually only put into place when the kernel boots, um, and even kernel ASLR is like really recent, like last like five or six years, I think. Um, if you go back to like 2010, 2012, like kernel ASLR was extremely rare to find. So, and I and I think Apple was the first to do that too, probably. So. Yeah, it's definitely not a commonplace in the boot ROM. So it's it's a very straightforward bug. It's an easy exploit, and it hits a lot of devices. So, um, yeah, it's definitely worth keeping an eye on. Uh, we'll wrap up the exploit section with a release of technical details around a type confusion in iOS kernels, uh, the iOS 14.1 kernels and older. They came out of Project Zero. Uh, this was found from the master of exploits himself, Ian Beer. Uh, this issue was patched in November by Apple. Um, it was found to have been exploited in the wild, which suggests that this issue is likely reachable from Sandbox. I'm not 100% certain on that because I couldn't find confirmation in the bug report, but it seems likely that this would be hittable from Sandbox, especially given that it's in the uh, the IPC uh, subsystem. 
Uh, the bug here is basically failure to handle edge cases around the turnstile feature, which was added in iOS 12. And it again has to do with unions being used stupidly. Um, by sending a crafted Mac message uh, to a destination port, which has a special reply local port attached to it, and sending the Mac sync, uh, send sync override flag, then changing that thread special reply port to a host notify port, you can force a type confusion. Um, when the special reply port gets read from, um, basically the code doesn't know that the user space owned port can switch to a host notify port. So when it goes to read the pointer from KData, it thinks the port it's pointing to is an IPC port. Meanwhile, it's actually pointing to a host notify port. So that's where the type confusion comes into play there. Um, and that can be used for out of bounds write and possibly arbitrary read write uh, as well. Um, I don't think they they fully fleshed that out, Ian Beer. I don't know if he like went down that path or just kind of reported it and and moved on. But um, yeah, well, they mentioned I think that the analysis isn't complete, so maybe we'll hear more about that. Maybe not. Um, yeah, yeah, because I don't know the tricks that would actually be used. Like I'm not familiar with the internals for those mock ports. It said, I mean, it does seem like it. It is kind of a classic issue with unions just being able to switch out the type of a union from underneath it yeah um yeah it, it's more reason just not to be using unions in general it's also just like it's hard to get that right it's hard to kind of follow this um and remember every sort of edge case that can happen in this case you've got the you know when you make it that uh host notify it it switches it, it does what it's supposed to. It's like everybody else has to be aware that that can happen. That's a hard thing to remember when you have a complex piece of code, such as um, like XNE or such as any kernel. You've got so much code there. Everybody needs to be aware that these things can happen. That's not an easy thing to do. And there's so much movement. Like even if you do know all the code that's interacting with it presently, there's probably some change happening on a subsystem that because because it's IPC, like it's going to be used in a lot of places. So, like I mean, that I suppose movement is also going to make it even harder to track. Would like using a big lock around it could help, but that would kill performance probably. Yeah. So, I mean, it's worth noting that uh, Ian points out this probably isn't exploitable on devices with pointer authentication or pack. Um, and that's because those pointers are tagged on pack devices. And this kind of shows where pack offers its value, not only in trying to prevent use after freeze, but it primarily it basically kills type confusions, as, as I understand it, um, with, with pointers at least. Um, that said, pack doesn't exist on devices older than A12 chips. So the iPhone X or earlier doesn't have it. So that's where the in the wild aspect, it was probably targeting those older phones. Um, but yeah, I mean, like you said, this is yet another example of unions and how they can screw you over. Uh, all you Also, you can save a few measly bytes of memory. Um, Ian even points out that the use of a union here is, is completely unnecessary um, and suggests the fix to be like breaking the union field out into separate members or adding a field uh, into IPC port for storing the type of the port, at least. Um, there was one final thing I wanted to call out that I thought was cool, though. Um, a section that was in the report. And that was, how do you think you would have found this bug? I don't remember seeing this on previous stuff from P0, but I really like this section. Uh, they go into some of the Vuln research methodology of how this issue could have been discovered by attackers. Um, in this case, they point out that it could have been found through variant or manual review, um, probably not through fuzzing due to the nuanced nature of the bug, though. But like that's just one of those things where you don't always get to see you don't always get to see that methodology behind it so i like that that was fleshed out here and i'd like to see that in more places yeah um so this is one of their root cause analysis which most of the things that we end up covering from project zero end up being like their actual kind of reporting on something and these root cause analysis the first time i'm really seeing them is with their recent post that was also this week uh, Deja vulnerability where they release like seven of these RCA files. I haven't seen them linked before. I don't know if the page where it link or there, there is a page that links like all of them. I hadn't seen it before. Apparently they have been around for a little while, uh, like earlier this year. 
Um, I think it's linked in this uh in this post, but I don't don't see the. There we go. Um, that'll be in the in the description. But so they have several root cause analysis that they've done. Um, these ones just being kind of recently put out, or this one being recently put out. Yeah, I, I like just, I, I like the format. It's concise. Exactly. It gives you the details, and there's. I mean, don't get me wrong. I like a lot of the Project Zero posts because we get a lot of the background. We get a lot of the thought process and all of that. But it is nice to just have these concise pieces also. Yeah, it's short, but it packs so much information into it. So th that's what I was going to call it, too, was like, I would totally rip off this report style because it's just it's so nice. And um, like if I was getting an assessment done, if I put myself in the headspace of like a company or something and I saw this kind of report, I would be very happy, I think, if I was in the uh, security like department. I think so. if you're getting a report, you probably want to include more about remediation um and developers you can't always expect to understand the you can expect them to understand the internals you can't always expect them to understand the vulnerabilities and why it's a problem so there's definitely more you'd want to have in there but this is nice for like another technical reader to take a look at in fact i do plan to try and make a rss feed out of just these root cause analysis yeah they're they're very nice to read uh for us so we'll jump into our research uh, paper of the day. Uh, this is a paper on the security of open source software when it comes to code review and why bugs are missed during code review. So I guess we we have a like a theme of open source, I guess, with this uh, episode. Um, they basically had two driving questions behind the paper, uh, one of which was which categories of security defects are more likely to be missed during code review, and the second one being which factors influence identification of security defects. So they used Chromium as a case study and did a manual and automated approach to collect 516 code reviews that caught security defects and 374 that didn't. Uh, they basically, the process behind that is they used automated data mining to pull, I think they said like 400,000 or so code reviews. Um, and then they filtered them based on 105 security keywords, which they do have laid out in the paper. Uh, they do have laid out in the table um, that's in the paper. Things such as buffer, overflow, DOS, format string, the, the kinds of keywords you would expect. Um, and then they manually inspected them to get a filtered data set down from uh, 1337 reviews, which, which was a cool number. Uh, they got that down to 516. For the data set of controls for the escape vulnerabilities, they data mined the bug tracker, looking at fixed commits, and automated looking at the git blame, and searched for cross-references of code reviews of that code. Uh, to which they found uh, 374 missed vulnerability instances in the code that were uh, peer-reviewed. So they then analyzed them to try to figure out what were the leading causes of those code reviews not catching the bugs they'd, they'd found. Uh, once they had all the data, they finally established a table of factors that could have influenced the identification of the bug. Um, pretty much anything that they thought they could quantify, basically. So the number of files that were under review in that code review, uh, the amount of code churn, uh, the cyclic complexity, the cyclic complexity of the code, the number of code commits uh, an author had submitted or reviewed, uh, the review time. I think there's like 20 different factors that they have laid out. Uh, they have that on page six uh, on table two. What they ended up concluding for their two questions was for the categories that were missed the most uh, and caught the most, use of unsafe functions like stir copy, sprintf, and stirlen were caught with high effectiveness. Uh, so were incorrect calculations and bounds checking, as well as memory leaks, which isn't much of a surprise because those are very noisy issues. Um, however, uh, security defects due to insufficient validation of data authenticity were missed very often. Um, in more than 88% of the case reviews they studied, it went undetected. Operation on a resource after release, uh, UAF basically, and exposing resources to the wrong sphere, uh, we're also in that list of uh, of lacking being caught in code reviews, which makes sense because those types of issues often span multiple functions and areas, whereas the calculations and stuff are a lot more localized. Um, like usually with the UAF, it's going to be on some kind of shared object. It's not going to be within the same function, whereas those calculation issues typically are. So that made a lot of sense to me, I think. I did also want to call out the fact that they didn't catch in review any of the insufficient verification of data authenticity stuff, which 
actually now that i'm seeing that there's yeah 13 escaped so 100 percent escaped the code review that one felt a little bit weird to me one that it would escape so my theory on why all of them escaped is probably because they would have expected this to be on to be handled more centrally uh such that they don't need it like the developers don't need to think about it uh kind of ad hoc every time they're using the data and said something should be dealing with it more centrally that would be my guess on why they just well, had that expectation it still kind of stood out to me because it is kind of it is kind of a big issue uh to just not catch at all yeah um so when they got into reasonings behind security defects uh being missed it, this was a lot more complicated to answer because it's it's more subjective and it's harder to quantify. Uh, they basically established a model using the factors I mentioned earlier, which they go into more detail about. Um, they summarize their findings on page nine, though, which is where I'm going to talk about it. Um, they they found basically the more movement there is um, in an introduced code change, the more likely the bug is to escape code review. Which again, it totally makes sense if you, if you're multiple. If you're working on multiple things at once or you're reviewing a lot of things at the same time, um, you have less time and attention to put on those more finite details. Um, and it's it's more likely that the assumptions will get lost or broken without realizing it. Um, they also found files with higher commit counts were more likely to have security defects escape during code review, which I thought was interesting. This one was one of the points that kind of went against the grain for me. Um, it's easy to think of it going the other way, thinking that files with less commits are less looked at and thus would have more things uh, escape. Um, but it mainly ties back to that idea of movement, I think. If the code's changing a lot, that old code assumptions get broken very quickly. Um, so it, it kind of makes sense when you think about it, but it, it was something that I hadn't really thought about until uh, this paper kind of highlighted it, I guess. Um, their other finding was experience of the reviewer does not help them to identify security defects. I think this one was a little bit more contentious for me. I mean, obviously, the more familiar you are with the code base and the more you know how it works, the easier it'll be for you to spot when something is wrong. Um, so I thought that was a little bit weird. Well, um, although they do kind of conclude that uh, we can imply that security defect identification requires specialized skill, which may not increase with participation of non-security code review. Uh, that's kind of towards uh, the end of this same page. Um, that kind of seems to be what they end on after they go through kind of the few different things there, that the reviewer doesn't seem to help that because th the security analysis seems to be a little bit special it requires a little bit more uh, specialized knowledge so just experience isn't what really helps you yeah i mean i would definitely be okay with saying it's one of the least impactful factors but the way they worded it saying uh it did not help them at all i think it's just like it's kind of weird to say that because I, I would think it would help at least maybe a little bit even if it's only a tiny bit um, um, but so yeah, the that other was the only thing, point that I found kind of contentious. I think the other thing worth noting is they're looking at the Chrome or Chromium. The yeah. people involved on this project are generally, I, I'm not sure I would consider this to be an average representation of like the average developer. Um, I, I think that's kind of worth pointing out too. Uh, like the types of developers that are working on Chrome. I mean, yes, you do get like some one-off commits, but the types that are doing the code reviews and such are likely, you know, in general, fairly good developers. Oh, I mean, I feel like that might create some biases in this data, too. Yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely a limited sample size, which uh, they do point out, to be fair. Um, so th that is something you should keep in mind. And not only that, like, you're looking at one project, you're looking at a subset of the reviews for that project, and you're looking at things that aren't easily quantified and have some subjectivity there. So it, it's it's definitely not something that should be taken like whole cloth, right? It's something that you should look at the nuances of um, and keep an in your mind when you read it. still an interesting analysis, though. And just out of chat, free SRX mentioned there are software platforms that analyze static code to catch security bugs, which devs rely on. There are, and most of them are crap compared to what a manual reviewer is able to do. 
and what manual code yeah. review was able to do. Uh, there's a place for the automatic, uh, like static analysis tools. Um, like they catch low hanging fruit, they catch uh, certain issues that maybe are a little bit more difficult to reason about. As long as you ca spend the time to really train and tailor the setup on it, it's a line of defense. It's not something that really should be relied upon for the security analysis, but just there is like a sanity check or an extra check to save time before you pull on actual uh, security professionals to do that same review. It's like fuzzing. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket into fuzzing and then think, oh, I'm fuzzing my code, it's safe. Like, you want to do the, the manual assessment as well and manually augment that. Um, and like you were saying, like, static analysis, there, there are some, some neat tools when you get into, like, the expensive pricey range. Um, but all, the free stuff that's out there is, like, I don't even think it's worth your time looking at. In all honesty, I mean, it, it's maybe a little bit harsh, but like, they're just not good. They're not good tools. I mean, I've used some of the enterprise stuff, too. Um, and I haven't generally been impressed. But the thing is, you need to tune your settings with a lot of them to get rid of so many of the false positives. Uh, most applications just take a while to kind of tune. They, they can be useful. I'm not saying there's no use in them whatsoever, because that's not true either. Um, but the manual code, it, it's just a separate tool. It's another tool in the toolbox. Both of them should be used. It doesn't replace it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, jumping back to the paper, I mean, yeah, I thought some of these findings in here were interesting. Uh, some of them were pretty obvious and as expected, though it, it's still cool to see some data backing that up. Um, but like I said, th there is that limited sample size, which they point out and they're aware of. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there were some interesting takeaways, I think, out of this paper. And uh, there, there's a big push to try to add security to open source, the open source side of things. Um, well, I guess th this benefits more than just open source. It's about code reviews in general. It's just using open source as a, as a case study. But, I mean, I, I like some of these, pap like some of these things we're covering. Um, I think a lot of our episodes tend to be more attack-heavy. Um, this episode, I think, is a bit more defense heavy. Uh, we've been covering some things to try to enhance security, and it's, it's it's nice to mix things up a little bit for a change with that. So, oh no, I mean, we've had a number of exploits on this episode, so I'm not sure I'd say it's a defense heavy one. More more uh, defense compared, heavy than compared, we've had a like, few more episodes. than normal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, we're we're definitely not only defense for sure. <laughs> I don't know um, how good uh, only defense one would be unless it's like. Uh, mitigate when we get to cover some mitigations and how to break those mitigations but yeah no i really appreciate kind of this study um i didn't find anything to be like shocking nothing was too surprising out of it but it's nice to actually have the numbers that back it up the some study that actually starts to back up these same things yeah oh. exactly but um yeah, I think that'll pretty much wrap up the podcast. Did you have any uh, additional thoughts on that uh, or any thoughts on anything in general before we uh, wrap it up? Oh, on anything in general? Um, yeah. I'm, no, I'm, no, I'm, I, no, I think we're good. <laughs> All right, no worries. Um, so yeah, thank you to everyone who listened or watched. Uh, you can catch the VOD on Twitch or YouTube at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific on Tuesdays. We also have previous podcasts up on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more links on Anchor. Um, check out our Discord and follow us on Twitter for updates on when the stream will be happening for the PS4 stuff later this week, as well as any other updates we make, because uh, there's definitely points of time where we do other content or uh, or we try to do something. So, And we're going to try to do more content uh, later on as well. So, yeah, go ahead and follow us on, on those channels. Um, we'll be back again next week, same time, 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific for the podcast. Um, until then, though, take care.